Uh, those of you who live on Mars will probably not know that um, it has been quite an important and a tricky day for Lord Coe, but he has made it, and I really am deeply grateful. Um, have a drink of water. And <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk for literally two minutes so that you can catch your breath and your thoughts. I don't want to talk about anything um, that's got to do with um, the controversy because it's not our place uh, and you've just done 28 interviews so I don't think you want to repeat any of that. I want this well, to at be... at least you're not here to see the Channel 4 interview today. You lose your Anyway, um, what we want to do is to track and for you to ask this extraordinary man um, how, what, and um, why he has done some of the most exceptional things that he has done. Uh, I read his um, sort of background and it came from a perfectly normal family. Um, like all the extraordinary people in the world, uh, you know, they, they come from ordinary family, but they achieve exceptional things. And as you all know, Sebastian Cohn is best known as one of the greatest athletes um, in history, setting uh, 11 world records, uh, three within 41 days, I gather. And of course, he's been Olympic medalist. Um, after that, he became a politician. Uh, he's now a member of the House of Lords. He led London uh, to win the Olympics um, uh, for Nakato, whatever. And most importantly, <laughs> was it 0212? Yes. Yes, sorry. But most importantly, it was his idea to get the Queen to jump out of the helicopter, <laughs> uh, which was the most extraordinary thing that anybody could have expected for the London Olympics. And I don't think any other city in the world for many, many years to come will produce a trump card like that. Um, he is now also uh, president of the IAAF, um, and um, it is in this connection. <laughs> it's slightly out of breath, but I don't want to hold this um, thing. Because we're a bit late, I want to open up immediately uh, to the floor to ask sensible, intelligent, and interesting questions. Uh, if they're not interesting, not the intelligent, they are channel park, I'm going to uh, pass you over. Uh, but I just, I just want to ask you one question. The most extraordinary thing I read about your life was a critical moment when somebody called Gandhi, who is not the Prime Minister of India, but spelled G-N-A-D-Y, uh, said to you that he had some revolutionary methods by which he could teach you to run faster. Now, I don't know who this Gandhi is, but I have always wanted to run faster. And I want you to tell us now what the secret of his revolutionary method and whether, in fact, you benefited from this. And that's the only question I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to ask you to everybody. Was it revolutionary? Uh, yes, it was. It, 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 yes, you're right. It, it wasn't um, Gandhi. It was George Gandhi, uh, who was a Geordie. And he was a biomechanical expert uh, from Loughborough University, my, uh, my university. Uh, and he was actually the person that introduced the concept that running was actually a technical event. Most people think running is just simply putting one foot in front of the other. But actually, again, all, all this stuff is now sort of bread and butter. But back then, it was sort of slightly voodoo science. I mean, it was very, very early days. So the thought that you would have a force platform in the middle of a gym and you would run time and time again and in very prehistoric video footage figure out how the balance of your foot hit the ground, what part of the foot hit the ground, uh, the transfer of uh, force through the, you know, all those sorts of things, the way you held your, you know, the carriage of your head, the way your arms were, all this was actually very, very new. So in on, on the basis that he did that, my father actually was started out as a mathematician and went on to become a mechanical engineer. Uh, you could probably say that I was put together by a combination of biomechanics and, and mechanical engineering. But all these rules, mathematics. all these mathematical rules like in all games, don't they actually go against your spon spontaneous and natural rhythm? 
um, and, uh, and sometimes impair what you actually can do better by not thinking. No, I think I was very lucky. My father, who really sort of choreographed all my, the whole of my career, but you know, the day I started in athletics was nearly the day he started. He got involved slightly afterwards. Um, but he, he always had this view that he couldn't understand why people didn't understand numbers. For him, it was a language. And I guess if you're a mathematician, it sort of is what you do. And I always remember, uh, just to give you a quick example of that, I always remember sitting in the Olympic Village in Moscow in 1980. I'd screwed up badly in the 800. And he was listening to a range of silent voices explaining what I had to do in order to win the 1500 meters. And while all this was going on, you know, the crisp ratio of the great observer journalist written a 30 page letter to me, you know, sort of inspiring me, Sibelius and the Lake District. And he was a wonderful man. And there were other journalists sitting there, and coaches suggesting all sorts of things. And all he was doing is he sat at this sort of four mica top tape in the middle of the village with an old propelling pencil and a piece of paper, and he was just scribbling numbers. It was number, 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 number. And then he cut through it all. He said, Right. He said, I've heard enough. He said, I've got the answer, and it's here. And he looked at me, and I thought, well, I'm going to get a lecture about running the first lap faster than the second lap, and all that sort of thing. He said, no, no, it's very much simpler than that. He said, I've just figured out that given the number of mistakes you made, and the frequency <laughs> with which you made them, and over the distance that you made them, it is well nigh impossible, statistically, for you to fuck up that badly <laughs> in the space of the next 10 years. And that was the only instruction I had. <laughs> Going into the 1500 meters, his absolute certainty on paper that statistically I could not run that badly again. So, yes, you're right insofar as sports science is a, can give you insights and it can help you do all sorts of things in training, it can, you know, it can make sure that you run at optimal speeds when you don't actually need to run any faster in training, you, you want to avoid overuse symptoms, those sorts of things are hugely helpful, but as my father and any good coach will tell you, actually coaching is probably more of an art than it is a science. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're, throughout history, we're not very technically efficient. And he's also a very good painter. Good yeah. he, uh, he, I, I didn't actually come from an ordinary family. I mean, I did insofar as you know, we were not, you know, we were not a wealthy family. But he was a, a mathematician who became a mechanical engineer and could paint delightfully. My mother was an actress and was rather trained. So and, and she. Oil or my, water? My grandparents were Indian. So uh, both. Half, 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 half Indian. Half yes, Indian. Um, yes. So my. Uh, no, he could paint and he was a very, very accomplished sculptor as well. Well, there it is. Um, I just want to ask one final question. When you go racing, so what, we Chinese don't have as much hair as the, as, as the Westerner. Do you have to shave it off in order, like those cyclists, in order to maximize your flow? <laughs> <laughs> you have a Brazilian wax. <laughs> many, many years ago, and, and then received, uh, my office were not best pleased, was they then received about a thousand letters. But I said that I'd retired before it became obligatory to wear Lycra or marry a Spice Girl. <laughs> and I got thousands of letters back, and one of them, I actually probably put it in the right frame by saying, why on earth would you think they would want to marry you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, well, who has got a good question? All right, the man was very fast. You look like that comedian. Um, on, have I got news for you? Oh, wait, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, is, you look like the editor of the private eye. Yeah. No, you're not. I'm certainly not that. Um, I don't know all the problems. Problem. Right, but, um, without, without divulging any official secrets, um, going back to the London 2012, how did you get Her Majesty to jump out of the plane? <laughs> um, I'll try and keep it short because it's actually a lengthier dis discussion. Um, there, is, there are only 
two moments throughout the whole games, really, where I really did feel the globe wobbling. Uh, I had a chief executive, one of the most talented people that I'd ever been my fortune to work alongside, a guy called Paul Dighton. And we were both sitting in our office one morning, and in walked Danny Boyle, the creative director of you know, Train Spotting and 24 and all the other great movies that he's done, and Frankenstein and the National Theatre. And he said, Look, we've got this lovely um, Lancashire borough. And he went, You know, he said, I've done a little bit of work, and there are two iconic people in the UK one is the Queen. And one is James Bond. And you know, wouldn't it be good to get them to jump out of a helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> and there are, I think, there are I've got some very good friends in here who do know Paul Dighton probably as well and better than I do. And it is the only time, and I've never seen him flustered, but it is the only time. <laughs> and he really did put the edge of the table and thought, oh, please, where, you know, what, what are we, how are we going to do this? And so there are a number of conversations, and actually, in the end, Danny Boyle sold it to Her Majesty. And thank goodness she entered into the spirit of it. And I think it was one of the, it was one of the warmer, enduring memories of, of, of the games. I, I do remember sitting in front of the two royal princes in the, uh, the box at uh, 2012, because they, they had no idea. They, they kept it, the whole thing was kept so quiet that actually only the Princess Royal was aware uh, of the lunacy of the suggestion. <laughs> uh, and they couldn't quite figure out where this was going. And of course, when the helicopter appeared, they got frightfully excited. And as the Queen jumped out of the helicopter, one of them, I can't remember which one, screamed, go granny. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the stand-in, in fact? The, I mean, did she look like the Queen? Well, uh, uh, the, the, there is actually an element of sadness in this because, of course, we had two uh, stunts. And the Queen uh, was a wonderful guy who we talked to beforehand. And, of course, you had to be very careful here because you know, it, it's, you know, you, it's not just done that. If you think about the Olympic Stadium, it's a spiders web with catenary cables, you have the opening ceremony, so you have a lot of stuff flying around. And so to do this meant, and we tried it time and time again, we actually had a, we had the old um, forward car plant at, at Dagenham where we drew out the contours of the stadium, we drew the, you know, we even got the cable in, and we just decided it was too dangerous to, one would do it, but to have two going out simultaneously with wind direction. So in, in essence, we had to do it into the car park by the stadium. Um, and sadly, the guy that was the James Bond guy died a few, uh, literally a few months ago in a stunt uh, uh, piece of work he was involved in in, uh, in, the, in the Alps. So it was, you know, these guys do live you know, on, a, on a thread. Perhaps you can do it to Putin in the attitude. <laughs> Push him out from the helicopter. I'll leave, I'll leave that with you. Another <laughs> <laughs> question. Yes. If you can broadly put your life's achievements into categories, uh, politics, athletics, philanthropy, etc., which one would you say you've enjoyed the most? Actually, in, in, a, in their way, I've enjoyed them all, and I still get great pleasure from them. I mean, <laughs> I would say I left politics in 1997. Politics left me in a very big way. Uh, in 97, I did four years in the opening salvos of, a, of an opposition. There's nothing more marginal than working in an opposition party that's you know that's been that's drifted from government into opposition. That that was an extraordinary period. And I worked for one of the cleverest people and one of the people I probably admire the most, William Lee. <coughs> that was a great period. My um, brief period as a member of parliament in an extraordinary constituency in, in deepest Cornwall, you know, fighting the EU over fisheries quotas and all that. So that was a, an experience. I was a, for a short period of time a government whip in a party that was drifting out. That was a character forming uh, experience. <laughs> My athletics was 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 a wonderful experience competitively and. and 
many, many people to thank along the way, including one Antonio Samaranch, who gave me the opportunity to understand a little bit more about the complexities, complexities of international poetry. And, you know, then the dream scenario of being given the opportunity to bid and successfully work alongside an extraordinary team to win the right to stay to the games and then to deliver it and probably <laughs> the next chapter which you know started a few weeks ago <laughs> may well be the most challenging of them all. When you first uh, saw a Chariots of Fire, what were you doing at that time? Oh, when was Chariots what did you think? Was it 1981? I think it was. Um, yeah, 1981. Well, 1981 was a good year for me. I broke five world records. Is that all? <laughs> well, only, well, only five because I then decided at the end of the year to go away on holiday. And the mile world record changed hands three times in nine days. So I broke it in Zurich. And then Steve Obet uh, broke it a couple of days later in Koblenz in Germany. And I was actually at the end of what was a long season. I still had the uh, I had the World Cup at the end of the year to compete in in Rome, um, and I decided that you know I really did need to to take a holiday, and so I thought the only way I'm really going to be able to get a holiday is to put the mile out of out of uh, his reach for at least a few weeks, so I can go go off on holiday. So my inspiration for, for breaking the mile in Brussels which stood for a number of years, was literally so I could genuinely go on holiday. And <laughs> and he then went off to uh, Norway a few days later. Um, but maybe the, the, the geography was a little lacking because he went up to Bergen. It was about minus two at the end of September, so he, he didn't get it. So um, that was 1981, and I guess athletics, were, you know, it, it, in, in British terms, it was the high water mark. I mean, it was a sport that was on the front page. 1981 was also an interesting year because I broke the world record in Zurich. And it's the first time the 9 o'clock news was broken into for anything else other than the news. So they went live. How about next week? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but they went live into the race in Zurich. And I remember a very nervous phone call from the head of sport at BBC saying, if you don't deliver, he said, I will almost certainly lose my job. <laughs> I persuaded the head of news and the director general that this is the right moment for the very first time to break into the nine o'clock news. So it was a year where everybody was obviously very interested in athletics, and I guess David Putnam and, and the guys that crafted the film were conscious that this was the right moment to revisit. Well, there are two examples of where you were under intense pressure, one being fired and the other being somebody that you were a fierce competitor that drove you to, um, to, to win. Uh, how many people have actually run the mile under four minutes? Uh, um, actually, that's, that, that, I don't know the answer to that. But I'm I, well, I don't know, but I'm told that more people have climbed Everest than individually run a sub-four minute mile. And again, that's, you know, it, it's one of those things that, oh, it's a four minute mile, and it was done in 1954. Four minute mile is still an extraordinary physiological achievement. Can I ever? <laughs> those days may be behind you. <laughs> still a politician. One minute, that, that, over there, yes. Yes, uh, on the subject of world records, as an avid sports spectator, one of my greatest memories is. 800 meters world record, which stood for such a long time. Um, do you think athletics needs world records? Do you think world records should be slowing down? Are they slowing down? Can you see a time when actually world records aren't set? No, not really. I don't. I, you know, evolution and technology. I mean, it, it's you know, we're not going to take the kind of chunks out of them that we've sort of been used to. We're probably not going to see. You know, the, the great big breakthroughs where two minutes is taken off a marathon time, but actually every now and again you do get shocked and surprised by the way world records do. I mean, the 800 meters is a good example. There have only been four holders of the world 800 meter record since 1975. 
1975, that was broken by the great Cuban athlete, who actually is now my, one of my council colleagues, the other player, Alberto Monterrey. I broke it in 79. Uh, that then stood until 98. Wilson Kipkater broke it then. And just recently, David Radisha, first of all in Oslo, and then, of course, magnificently in London, the best single, oh, I'm biased, but I thought it was <laughs> by a country mile, a country it means. Um, <laughs> the most extraordinary piece of athleticism I've probably ever witnessed in a stadium. And there was actually quite a nice moment because one of my great, great friendships is with Kip Kane, that we always think of as the senior partner, really. He was the sort of the, the father of African distance running, middle distance running, particularly, as you know, he won the record holder, he won the Olympic title in 68 at 1500 meters in Mexico, altitude, he then won the, uh, broke the, uh, what he, uh, won the Olympic title at the steeplechase. And I said to him before the 800 meters, why don't you come and sit with me? He's an IFC member in Kenya. Wonderful one. And has a, an, he has an orphanage, which is self-funded. He has had 600 kids through his orphanage. And 32 of them won Olympic medals. <laughs> so he's got a pretty good eye <laughs> for, for talent. And I said to him, why don't you come and watch the race with me? It's going to be a Kenyan, you know, this will be a Kenyan celebration. He said, no, I'd love to. And I saw him before the race, said, come on, come and watch it with me. And he sat down, he looked really quite agitated. And I said, well, you know, because he's a very calm, calm guy. And I said, what, what, uh, you know, what's the problem? He said, well, I've just been down to the warm-up track. And there were three Kenyans in the final. And he said, I turned to the youngest, an 18-year-old, who actually ultimately got a bronze medal and had finished third. And he said, OK, boys, what, what's the tactic tonight? You know, are you going to run as a team? Are you going and so this young kid said, pointed at David Radisha and said, I'm going to follow him. <laughs> and Radisha looked at him, and this is what blew Kip's mind. Radisha looked at him and said, no, 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 don't do that, because if you do, you will die. <laughs> he said, because I'm going to break the world record tonight. <laughs> and, you know, for mere mortals that have actually been to an Olympic final, I mean, it really doesn't matter whether it takes you six days to get across the line. You just want to be across the line in first place. And this guy was so physically able and so mentally <coughs> at the top of his game that he's not actually thinking about a race that he subsequently won, the, the, the greatest 800 meters of all time. He's actually not even, not even thinking about, you know, calibrating the margins between a gold or a bronze, or do I, do I sort of take care? He just went for it. He went from gun to take. He, you know, he was never headed in that race, and he just got better and better, and I think it was just, to me, just the extraordinary moment. And he would have run that in training, do you think, before him? I doubt it very much because, you know, the one thing in training that you do is you, you rarely run that distance. What you do is you, your training is aimed at, again, without getting too technical or scientific, your middle distance training is aimed at stimulating five sort of different systems over five types of different training. So you have your steady state work you need to do in the 10, 12, 15 miles on the road that builds up your aerobic capacity. You need all the strength work I was talking about, the famous George Gandhi that helped me with. Then you have your speed endurance, you have your flat out speed, you have your interval work. And so it is unlikely that you would ever run an 800 meters in a time trial, but you would break it down into component parts. And the guiding principle is a really simple one, and it's probably one that stands you know, scrutiny in almost anything that you do, and that is, your training is geared to make sure that nothing you are ever confronted in a racing circumstance you haven't covered a thousand times beforehand on the training track. So he probably didn't run those distances, but if you break down the distances that make up that type of training, he will have run like the wind. Okay, yes. Thank you, woman. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Well, here is the China Exchange. Obviously, we need to ask some questions related to China. So I'm playing this role now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, my question is, um, do you have any unforgettable experience in terms of your, uh, related to China, in, in terms of, uh, uh, in term of uh, with the China Association or China athletes? Do you have any, any uh, unforgettable experience related to China? Yes, yes I do, and again it's worth remembering that no two cities uh, have ever in the history of the Olympic Games or World Athletics Championships followed each other. So we had 2008, 2012, yeah. London, the Games, and now, and then, of course, we find ourselves oh. with Beijing last, or this year, this summer, the World Championships, and in two years now, the World Championships coming to London. So I have in extraordinarily close relationships and friendships with China at a political level, oh. uh, and obviously through sport, and also through uh, the Athletics Federations, to Zhou Kaidu, who is my, oh. now my council colleague, Right. Uh, on the IAAF, and I even met the, uh, the country's president <coughs> after I won the election in uh, in Beijing. So no, we have very close relationships. Right. So you were you were in China when you were very young. Uh, yes, I first went to China actually uh, as an athlete uh, many many years ago. Uh, then of course. Uh, once uh, London had won the right to stage the games, we became effectively the next cab off the rank. So um, the International Olympic Committee does ask cities to insert themselves as observers into the program as soon as you can. And that's a really important process because you know, it, there aren't that many people that have delivered games and you do, you do lean very heavily on previous games and I was unashamed about what I wanted to absorb uh, and take to London. So, you know, what, and what do I mean by that? You know, I, I wanted the way a city uh, parted and absorbed the games and just the spirit of them, and that was sort of Barcelona. And then the extraordinary urban regeneration around Barcelona, uh, Sydney was just a blast, and I, I, I felt that that's something that we needed to replicate uh, in London. The forensic eye for detail, and the Chinese, the, 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 the Beijing Games, and particularly the Paralympic Games in, in China, raised the, the, the bar. And I think up to Sydney, we could probably say that Sydney was the high water mark. For urban regeneration and solid, solid legacy, um, Barcelona was extraordinary. The way Vancouver absorbed the games into a, a city was a really, uh, gave us a lot of awful expression, though, because I can't think, of, can't think of a better one. But, but the forensic eye for detail and the way that the athletes were at the center of the project uh, in China was, for me, a very, very important lesson. And a closing ceremony of uh, Beijing, uh, yeah. having witnessed. We weren't going to match that. <laughs> spectacular, and, and, yeah. and, um, and, and the buses came along. Uh, were you slightly despondent and saying, Christ? No, I, I, actually, it's a, it's a really good point you make. I, sadly, my father died on the, uh, at the, uh, the night of the Beijing opening ceremony, uh, and I flew, actually, flew to, 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 to Beijing, so I didn't see the opening ceremony. And I got there, and Bill Morris and our teams, our creative teams, all sitting there looking, I have to say, a bit shell shocked. <laughs> and they said, oh, we're never going to do that. And I said, good, because that's not what people are expecting. This was an extraordinary opening ceremony, it, you know, but it, 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 it was a Chinese opening ceremony. And I didn't want us to simply sit there and say, well, okay, then we have to, we have to match that. We couldn't have matched, we didn't have the budget to do that. And that's not what people wanted. And the great, and one of the arguments I often have is, oh, well, of course, if the games just went to one place every four years, you'd save this and you'd save that, and it would be, you know, you wouldn't have all the arguments around it. But actually, the beauty of the games is it does. It goes from Beijing to London, from London to Rio. That actually is the beauty of it. And the real skill in organizing a game, so particularly in opening ceremonies, of course you want something that is instinctively and uniquely about yourselves, but you must never forget that you have 200 and something other nations that you are hosting, and I think, I think we, we got that right. Yes. 
Um, with hindsight, would you rather have uh, run for Mayor of London? <laughs> no, no, no. Look, you know, these are dark days, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that this isn't, you know, this isn't a massive, massive challenge. But I, 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 I chose to do it. I joined an athletics club when I was 11. You know, I started my athletics career in inner city Sheffield, the, the municipal scrubby track the wrong end of the city, and I owe everything I, the only reason I'm sitting here, I don't kid myself, I'm not here because I was a spectacular or pioneering politician or a great businessman, I'm here because the sport defined me, and I threw my hat in the ring because I wanted to make change, and probably didn't expect quite, quite the extent of that change when I did that, and I wouldn't want to be doing anything else other than this, and we have those changes to make. And I will do it to the best of my ability. Yes. Hi. Um, we used to ask you about sort of the next generation of athletes, the children. Um, and I guess um, we live in a world that's quite, that's quite difficult for children, and there's lots of competing pressures <coughs> for money and investment. Yeah. How do we make sure that that we find space for those children to be engaged in athletics, and how yeah. important is it to you? It's the biggest challenge. In Britain or all over, all over the world, anywhere. Yeah, anyway. It's the biggest challenge. There, I think there are two challenges um, <coughs> for my sport, and one of them is how, how do we engage with young people? And actually, I, I'm trying, well, I will. I, I will stop the sport from getting down into the weeds too quickly. You know, whenever I sit and discuss this, I, I'm, you know, I have people saying, well, we need to take a round out of the men's triple jump, and maybe the you know race walk isn't something that people really. But actually, that that's all. That's sort of the how. It's it's what you will get to. But what I'm more interested in here, and you're right. Um, and hey, you know, I feel this probably more acutely than most people on the planet today. You know, my sport is about trust, and we have sorely tested people in that over the last, particularly the last few days, uh, and probably for longer than that. And the most critical stakeholder we will have are young people. I've got four kids, they're all under there. They see the world differently. They don't sit there any longer having a, you know, having a massive belief in institutions. I'm not saying they sit there questioning everything, but they just don't see institutions in the way our generation did. We on balance probably felt they were at best on our side and at worst sort of benign. They don't see that. They don't see it that way. So when I'm shaping the sport going forward with my colleagues, I think we have to be really conscious of the world that young people now live in. They are at the moral hotspots, the crossroads of all the big issues. They're probably fighting issues that are we're being honest, of a more practical nature than things that you and I used to fight for, and certainly things our parents used to fight for. They don't see your sport or your instant, your organisation through simply the eyes of whatever the activity is you're doing. They want to see that you reflect the world they live in. They're profoundly anti-discriminatory. Uh, they are, have issues about globalisation, racism. I mean, these are things that we need to address. So. Yes, you know, I think there are lots of things we can do to encourage and excite young people into the sport, but I need to understand a great deal more about what they are excited by, what they're nervous by, what they don't think we're doing with is good enough, where we're not responsive. And that's not the same as throwing out or jettisoning our philosophy simply because people, you know, want to see javelins dipped in petrol and light up the sky in the stadium. But we do have to listen to what they're saying. And I think there's a fundamental rule here. We're no longer in charge of the message. We think we are, we're not. They're in charge of the message. And if the product and our experiences that we present to them are inauthentic, they will move on. And they'll rarely move on to anything that is of interest to them. Let me just make one other broader point. Actually, whether they come into my sport is important to me, but it's not the crux of the issue. We've got a problem which I think is going to be a drag anchor on all our economies wherever we live, and 
that is that we are effectively becoming a population of physical inactivity. And I, I don't want to enter a morbid note, but of the, 10, <laughs> of the 10 biggest killers out there that are non-communicable diseases, they are not uniquely, but they are inextricably linked to physical inactivity. The average child in the UK becomes 50% less active between the age of eight and 40. Uh, the populations of the UK, Brazil, <coughs> the US, and China, 50% uh, of us, of them, will be physically inactive by 2030. And I think that's unsustainable. So whether they take up athletics, whether they are you know, encouraged to walk to work rather than take the tube, um, and, and this isn't a public health issue, We've gone down that road for far too many years where everybody's going, oh, well, that's an NHS problem. It's not. It's about tax and spend. It's about changing the curriculum in the first couple of years of architecture to actually get new, young architectural students to understand that urban planning is about not building physical activity out of the landscape. It's about freeing up space. If we have, you know, if we think it's a virtuous thing to zero rate you know, the AT on books and school clothing and, and food, then well maybe we need to do that on gym memberships. Maybe we need to do that on, you know, encouraging people to nudge and, and, and change their behaviour. But that's not something that is, well, it's, it, we haven't achieved it by going down the old road of saying, well, that's a national health problem or that's about public health. It's not. It's a much more deep-seated, holistic challenge. I went to a school in East London few months ago talking about this exact issue and I said, you know, interesting, why don't you write to work? Why don't you walk on? You know, well, bikes get hit. If I uh, do walk to work, the work, walk to school or cycle, then I go through a different gang neighborhood, I get beaten up. Now, that's a law and order issue. That's not about public health. That's not, that's not something the NHS is going to fix. So I think we've got, I, I actually think that this is not now a, anything to do with sports participation. It is how do you get people to be more physically active? And I think that's, I think this is a time of point of view. But, but I'm mean, aggravated by the rubbish food, the processed food. The, yeah, 42% of all processed food consumed in Europe is consumed in this country. Well, there it is. <laughs> okay, now, um, this was supposed to have been six to seven o'clock, but- Never no, mind, that wasn't eight. That, well, I, I will, I will stop at 7.17, 7, okay? <laughs> um, and so we've got a few more questions now, quickly. Um, all right, at the back, and then the middle, and then up here. And then we'll go to this side. Uh, Lord Co, first of all, I'm 46, and uh, my sons are approaching the age I was when you had that, the, all, all, the three of them, you know, for about five years, the marvellous battles with Stobo Bettens and Steve Cram, and it's probably the defining images of, of, of sports watching for me and, and inspiration. And I, I actually wonder who my children are about that age now. Who, who, who for the World Championships, what's the, I mean, on a positive thing, what's the most exciting thing that you're looking forward to the battles of the, the next uh, World Championships? And a sort of a secondary question, the domination of the East Africans in the field that you were in, you know, do you see that anyone else can catch them up? But what's, what, what makes that happen? I mean, that's a difficult question, but... I don't know the answer to the last question. I think these are cultural as much as they are sporting. I, I, I take a sort of slightly different view. I don't think you pick a sport. I think your sport picks you. Uh, I know why I went into athletics or running, because I just love running. I like solitude. I like, you know, I like the team life of being in a team, but I liked an individual sport. If you spoke to my four kids, they'll tell you that they love being in a team sport, they love the camaraderie around, you know, playing in a hockey or football or, or, or rugby team. That's what picked me. East Africa is, you know, okay, there are some, you know, there are some uh, climatic and certainly some altitude advantages. You know, if you've been born, you know, at altitude, and you're, you know, hundreds of generations of, of of people that have lived at uh, seven and a half thousand feet, coming down to sea level is 
you know, it's a bit like being turbocharged, so there are some advantages. But that's not the only thing. There is a freedom and a spirituality about their running um, that I don't always witness in Europe. You know, I, uh, if I talk to European coaches, they sort of think that they... It, it's interesting, I spoke to a group of kids the other day at an Easter gathering of young athletes. The most engaging, exciting, the most probing questions I got were all from the kids. As soon as I spoke to the coaches, they looked a bit like war-weary generals who had just been out in the field too long and couldn't contemplate, you know, running toe-to-toe -to -toe with East Africa's finest. Uh, and my coaches would never accept that. I had Mike Boyd, I had Henry Rono, I had James Minor. Well, the difference is that we didn't have the, the depth athlete from East Africa, but I certainly had African athletes that were comparable, and, and actually the times are comparable today. So I, I think that if you look at East African athletes, if you look at the fact that you know, life in the West, and certainly in Europe, has become a little bit softer for kids. I don't mean that's not a sort of Daily Mail observation, it's just <laughs> the reality that when you talk to you know, athletes even today in Kenya, they're running 10 miles to school in the morning, it's running 10. There is, a, there is a freedom and a spirituality about their running that I think we've slightly lost. Uh, there's a, a sort of, an, a, a, in a way, a, a obsession with sports science. I sat down with an athlete the other day who was asked to sit and chat to a young 800 meter runner. We talked about training. I said, do you do 300s in training? He said, no. I said, well, you don't or you choose not to? He said, no, no, I don't. I said, no, 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 that's not the question I'm asking. It's the staple diet of 800 meter running. Do you run 800, 300 meters in training? He said, no, I, I don't do that. And I said, right, okay, why don't you do it? He said, well, my coach said that I would develop more than three millimoles of lactic acid. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm just guessing I'd probably develop that, you know, in warm-up. But I think we've sort of got rather absorbed in that. Uh, what am I most looking forward to in London? I'm most looking forward to great head-to-heads. That's, that's what athletics is about. We can be a bit preoccupied with time. You know, some of the best, some of the best races I've seen, you know, the time has been absolutely, you know, secondary. You know, people tend to forget one of the best 1,500 meters of all time, which was Ron John Walker winning his Olympic title in 76. It was 3.41, 3.42. It's the sort of time I was running in Yorkshire schools. You know, when I was 15 or 16. So, uh, it, it just I just want to see some really great head-to-heads and some unfettered competition. And Christ, I just wanted to be the 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 great hair. Yes, you worked with Boris Johnson. I wondered if you thought he'd make a good prime minister, and what do you think of the prime minister? At least he would be a cycling prime minister. Yeah, no, Boris's commitment to physical activity his bicycle is <laughs> <laughs> <He's>, uh, <laughs> legendary. He's always late uh, on his bike. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you not so much about what your proudest of achievement, but what about in your own career you actually enjoyed the most, what aspect of running? Oh, just running. running. Yeah, I mean, this was the day you just sat for a hard day, like the day you just could like, go out for a run. Yeah, I just, and I was brought up in. I had, if I had, had the choice of living anywhere in the UK, I would live in the Peak District, and that was my backyard. I was brought up in Sheffield, so... You, know, you run to... every day, Phil? Uh, no, not every day, um, although it feels like it in the last three four months. I run every day. I run for cover. <laughs> <laughs> no, so the Peak District. So if you said to me, you know, what is it? I just love the physical sensation of running. Uh, three questions on this side, yes. Um, you and then that man who looks like a physicist. I just wanted to ask if you have the sporting prowess and success, could you pop along one day to Twickenham and advise them what to do? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love rugby, but I barely understand the game. Yeah, yeah the, the to lose the track. Do you know, am I the physicist? <laughs> um, <laughs> Lord Coe, um, What's the secret to being an effective leader? I don't know. <laughs> I think that's too general a question. No, I, I think, uh, look, I, 
I, I forget the leadership argument. If you say to me, what, what do I think? I think the world sort of seems, in my humble experience, to separate into two groups of people. There are those that are just restlessly curious about what is around the corner. Um, and I guess that's always been, you know, why I've done what I've done. I've just always been fascinated as to how far I could, you know, take. If it was athletics, how fast could I run? What, what could I do to be a better athlete this time next year than I am now? The day I retired is it actually probably answers the question, the day I retired. I remember very well, I was running, just have a house in Twickenham, I, it was, I was 34, it was 1989. I probably could have gone on a few more years, sort of, you know, sort of out thinking people on the track because I just knew enough about how to always eat out to win if I had to. But I, it was interesting, it was early in the morning, it was the end of a seven, eight mile run. And I don't know why, but my mind started wandering a couple of miles from home, and I thought, it suddenly occurred to me that at this stage in every season, I've been able to sit back and think, well, look, I can probably change things. I can mix the, you know, the combination of endurance and speed. I can start the gym and maybe a bit earlier, start it later. I can, you know, I can change. I could even move abroad. Do just, I could always figure out or envisage doing something differently that would allow me to be quicker. And it suddenly occurred to me, I'm probably never going to run quicker than I have. And that was where I, ran, I remember it very clearly. I ran back to my kitchen, took the, my shoes off, rang my old man and said, oh, that's it, I've finished, I'm done. And, and that's what I did. And I guess for me, it's, you know, it's just always being excited and interested and curious about just, you know, what's around the corner. And, and I, I've got, really good friends who have excelled in in a way that I've never excelled. Um, and I think that's, for me, that is the guiding guiding principle in their lives. Whether it's born, whether it's developed, I don't know, but they are just fascinated about the world they live in and, and, and what's, what's around that corner. Two more questions, we only got two more minutes. Uh, yeah. You in your t-shirt and, and your name <laughs> in your t-shirt. That's coach. Are you a coach? Yeah. You are? Yes. A coach in what? Uh, football. Are you any good? <laughs> <laughs> Coaching on football. Well, uh, English football doesn't seem to be very good at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not responsible. <laughs> I'm sure really, the, the, all the greatest leagues, all the greatest players individually, and you haven't done anything since 1966. <laughs> <laughs> Right, ask the question. <laughs> Just relax, feel fine. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of unjust criticism at the minute around the, the legacy of the 2012 Olympics, and something which I disagree with um, involving sport professionally on a grassroots level. Um, looking in 10 years on from the Olympics, which really is, is probably a good time to assess the, the legacy. What would you like to see as a, a successful legacy for the 2012 Olympics? I was never tightly prescriptive about where that leg, you know, I wanted, I wanted in every sliver of the project, I wanted legacy. Um, yes, of course, I want more young people playing sport. And, you know, on balance, we've got that. But that's, that's not a, that was never going to be a, a you know, you coach, you know, sport. It's never going to be that kind of line. <clears throat> um, that's important. We've got a million and a half more people involved in sport than we had in 2005. So the very worst you can say about that is we stopped that hemorrhage of participation that was taking place before then. Um, again, I think the Paralympic Games were an absolute game changer. I really do. I don't think anything in my life has changed the perception uh, about disability in the way the Games did. I think it really redefined the way we defined disability and impairment. Uh, East London, I think, you know, if you've been there recently, I mean, I remember in 2005, 10 years ago this year, standing on a, a, on a viewing platform at <laughs> an old people's home, looking down on a pile of, well, it was just a scene of devastation and underdevelopment and, you know, <laughs> must have sounded like a vaguely fraudulent Spanish timeshare salesman because I found myself saying, <laughs> so you see where that 
sort of 50 foot high pile of rotting fridges, well that's where the Olympic Stadium is. <laughs> you know, tower blocks over there where East London students go, well that's where the velodrome's going, and yeah, I know that the, you know, the, the, the dead fish and the mattresses and the Tesco supermarket trolleys and that room is going to be clean, and you know, clean, we physically cleaned 800,000 tonnes of soil. You know, so that in itself it, it is extraordinary. London, and I don't want to be broken about this, you know, but actually London has for the last three years, on every indecision assessment, emerged as the number one global city for cultural fluencies, for creativity, for entrepreneurship, for innovation. And that's, that, there's no coincidence with the game. So yeah, on, on pretty much every indices I've wanted wanted that and the, and, the, and the skill will be you know to, to continue to drive that the economic dividend is now sitting at about 17 billion off the back of the game British businesses have won a much much more business and a bigger chunk of the market because of successfully delivering the games but no you're right if you'd said yeah, what did I really want I want I want sport and I want elite level sport to be the attraction and the inspiration for young people to want to take up this sport. I, I just, I will go to my grave knowing that the greatest driver of participation are the Chris Hoys and the Jessica Ennises of this world. It tends not to be because public authorities are telling you that unless you sort of jog every day, you're going to have a heart attack at the age of 40. So I think role models that emerge through well-funded sport um, are are a real driver of all the things that we've been talking about tonight. Okay, last question. Thank you. Um, just to continue, really, um, the legacy, um, my friend and I were both um, volunteer performers in the opening ceremony. Thank you. What, was, were you. what were you performing at? We were pandemonium drummers. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and we, um, I don't think everybody realises there's a huge legacy of volunteering. Yeah. I should have mentioned that. Has continued. Too, and yeah. um, we created a lot of Facebook groups, networks. Yeah. So we are we basically a lot of that hundreds, if not thousands, of people all yeah. around the country, and a lot of them yeah. in London and the southeast, are very involved yeah. in all kinds of sporting activities, yeah. cultural activities, you name it. Yeah. I can go anywhere now and I won't know who's going to be there and I will always bump into somebody. No, it's, it's true. I walked least... in, you know, you're quite right. I walked into Twickenham the other day. Yeah. It, was like, it was like sort of being reunited with all my games makers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so and, I... and they're doing it overseas. Yes. And the human legacy off the back of the volunteering. So we've had a 6% increase in volunteering in the UK yeah. since the games. And quite a big spike immediately after the games in philanthropic giving, and I think those yeah. two somewhere, there's probably a causal link there as well. And on that, can I just mention the Special Olympics, because although they're not kind of mm -hmm. connected, I think I'm now involved in them, and I think it links what you were saying about um, sporting activity, but social activity, sense of achievement, and you can replicate. Mm -hmm. It isn't about being, you know, it's just about being the best you can be, yep. etc. And I just think Paralympics, Special Olympics, we can learn quite a lot actually from them, I think. In well, I think we have. Technology. I think we have. Well, I hope you meet a, a lot of people as a result of your volunteering work. I mean, I, and I hope that you take full advantage of uh, those contacts. Um, anyway, time is up, more or less. Um, for somebody who has never regard that physical exercise is something that um, ought to be <laughs> part of one's life. I'm full of admiration and I you know, admire even before I knew you uh, as being a bit of an icon because I think that um, your achievements are just uh, extraordinary. I mean, in terms of myself, I, as I said, I only run for cover. I do five kinds of exercises. I run for cover, I jump to conclusion, I stretch my imagination, I fish for compliments, and I jog my memory. <laughs> so today, today is a typical example of somebody who is considerate. And um, what a gentleman is, is that he is considerate. And notwithstanding your horrible day today, having to give 27 interviews 
um, holding on, holding your fort, and um, fighting your way through a, a, a huge controversy, you nonetheless took the trouble and determination to come here tonight. For me, it is a testament of the kind of determination that you must have had when you treat every single run, every single race, every single event in your life. And I think that that is what marks you out as an extraordinary person, having done extraordinary things, and no finer example than tonight for taking the trouble, nonetheless, of turning up uh, on a day which might not have been your most relaxed day, and entertaining us uh, to a huge extent, and being extremely informative and instructive. And I want you all to join me in thanking Sebastian Torres.